Welcome back to Chapter to Chapter. Today we'll be going over Part 1, Chapter 8 of George Orwell's 1984. Coincidentally, the last chapter of Part 1. Woo! Winston goes for a stroll through the parole district, which isn't technically illegal, but it's definitely frowned upon by the party. Every rebellion's gotta start somewhere, even if it is you know, walking where you feel like walking. Also, the city's uh, casually being uh, bombed by rockets. Totally normal Tuesday. The lottery, as described by Winston, is another one of the party's tools to covertly keep the proles in line. Give them something they feel they can beat, and the easier it is to pull the wool over their eyes. Like every casino ever. Winston also learns the resistance he's going to face delving into the unaltered past through the conversation he has with the elderly prole. The only information that Winston can get from this man is that before the party, the beer was better and cheaper. It's sad because the few remaining people that are left that know what the world was like before the party are either dying or drinking themselves into oblivion. Convenient. The parole man's recounting of history to Winston seems vague and doesn't really help him one way or the other. The man confirms that top hats were a thing, but the man clearly states that they were also worn by non-capitalists on special occasions. But the man does confirm the class system detailed in the party textbook, which confuses Winston because he was really hoping that the old man would kind of totally obliterate anything that the party was saying was fact and kind of leads Winston into this like, well, maybe the party is right and my memory is wrong. Now here's where being the reader is great. Uh, not that being the reader every other second of this novel is great because Winston's life is utterly and completely terrible, but we have a more accurate uh, description of history than Winston has, so we can actually look into this a little bit further. This man that Winston is talking to in the year 1984 is very old, so it's reasonable to believe that he was alive in the late 1800s because his sister's funeral was 50 years ago. Society, as you know, was very different in the 1800s. Victorian era England and its societal rules were still a large influence during this time. It wasn't necessarily fat cat capitalists demanding lower class folks to tip their hats at them. It was more of a lingering gesture of respect that was popular in Victorian era England that has been lost in translation in Winston's case. The party has done an excellent job of spinning history in its favor and using people's lingering hostilities towards a classist system to rise to power. Very clever indeed. We're getting closer to when the revolution truly took place. Um, my guesstimate right now is somewhere in the 1940s in a sort of alternate universe where instead of the allies winning the war, the ideas of like communism and fascism won World War II. So that capitalism would be viewed negatively since the countries that are big into communism in modern day, i.e. like Russia, North Korea, China, don't really have a favorable view of capitalism. And this would reflect why the party is like, capitalists are the most terrible people in the world. They are the literal embodiments of Donald J. Trump. I mean, what? Winston also realizes by the year 2000, no one would be left alive that remembers what life was like before the rise of the party. So that would mean anyone who was born before 1940, which by the year 2000 would make anyone like 60 years and older, would probably be dead. And in a situation where like you're being firebombed, there's probably not the best medicine and stuff, like living to 60 is probably pretty old. Winston considers going into the parole district suicidal behavior. Let that sink in for a moment. He feels it's suicidal to make a choice on where he wants to take a walk. Think about that. Going into that shop also falls into that category. A lot of important things occur within the shop. The first being Winston buys the coral paperweight. This is a tangible relic of the past and the shopkeeper even admits that there's practically no market for antiques anymore. This is due to the party severing people's emotional ties to the past 
and pretty much obliterating the emotion that is nostalgia. Not to mention having physical evidence of past events is like 150% against what the party is already doing since they have a literal building full of people burning things from the past that where they were wrong and did something wrong. Like, why would there be a market for antiques in this society? The shopkeeper talks about some old churches in London before the bombings and before the party. A picture of them is affixed to the wall and Winston becomes relaxed because he's used to telescreens being everywhere and said he gets this delightful portrait of nice old and timey churches, another tangible relic of the past. The shopkeeper sings a rhyme that used to be used to remember the names of all the churches, which ends, as most nursery rhymes do, the subtle promise of death. Here comes the chopper to chop off your head! We learn the shopkeeper's name is Mr. Charrington and has lived in the shop for about 30 years, a possible connection to the past for Winston. Then, like when the uh, anglerfish lights up in Finding Nemo, Winston's good feelings are gone when he notices the dark-haired girl from the Two Minutes Hate. She is seemingly following him through the Pearl District and Winston feels immediate guilt and even considers murdering the girl to get out of any sort of repercussions that there will be for him being in the Pearl District. Since that's a super healthy way of solving one's problems, murder! Now here, in the insanely creepy way that Winston is willing to murder a seemingly innocent young girl as she's walking, living her own life, doing her own thing, we see his dedication to his own cause. He figures now that she's had to have seen him out in the Pearl District, could have heard his conversations, uh, seen him purchasing that paperweight. He feels now that he's done all these things. He's definitely like marked for death. So he takes a big ol' swig of that victory gin, that high quality victory anything product. He gets out his diary, the most damning piece of evidence against him because he literally is writing things that get people killed in this diary. Not really the smartest way to be conducting a rebellion, but you know, Winston does his best. As he's holding this diary, and thinking of the dark-haired girl and all the things that he has done that day, exercising his free will as a human being to do what he wants, he contemplates suicide. Death on his own terms, rather than waiting for the thought police, the spies, malnourishment, exhaustion, or rocket bombing, is the ultimate form of rebellion Winston can achieve on his own as a member of the party. And if that doesn't darken your day... But instead of killing himself, Winston writes in the diary. Winston clings to the dream he had of O'Brien, the place of no darkness. Clings to the nearly hopeless dream that one day his mind will be fully his own. The truth of the past will be uncovered and freedom truly obtained. He then tries to smoke a cigarette and it falls to pieces in his mouth, symbolic of the facade put forth by the party. But in the end, Winston pulls out a coin and looks at the face of Big Brother. Now last chapter, that face was imposing. It was boring into his mind. It was making him feel as if the weight of all of his transgressions against the party were pressing into his chest. The face of his oppression. You can see here just how deliberately Big Brother was fashioned. On one hand, he looks commanding, intimidating, keeping people in line, always, always watching to see through your slightest hairline cracks. And on the other, calm, protecting, warm, embracing, familiar, safe safe from what's out there, safe from what the truth could possibly be. Because what if what Winston uncovers is worse than what the party is already doing? What if the party is right? Big Brother will keep him safe. Looking upon the comforting face of Big Brother, Winston cannot help but reflect upon the three slogans of the party. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. That's it for part one of Orwell's 1984, one down, two to go. Boo, 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 boo. The first part of the series is meant to be a little bit of world building, showing you um, what Winston is like, what the world he lives in is like, getting us acquainted to the setting of the story and the mood 
of the journey we are about to embark on. So what do you think is gonna happen in parts two and three? Also, a quick note, at the end of the series, I will be making a sort of bonus video that will be covering real world connections I couldn't help but make while I was doing the analyses of these chapters of this really amazing, incredible piece of literature. If that's something that you're interested in, just to let you know, it will be at the end of the series once I finish both parts two and three. And um, it's gonna be really cool. It's gonna be covering the current political climate that is going on in the United States and various social issues that are facing not only the United States, but the world as a whole. So if that's something that interests you, look for that in the coming weeks, months. I don't know how long it's gonna take me to do this, but I do know that I'm going to finish this. I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time for part two. Trolls get real coffee, but party members get the swill that is victory coffee. What even?